everybody looks at it differently, right? You know, for me, I believe that my responsibility in those type of situations is to get my twos in the game. But I think once those twos get in the game, then they deserve Welcome to the Straight the from right the Crest podcast. And the chance to play and compete. Season three, week two of the Penn State football podcast brought to you by Straight from the Crest. I'm your host, Michael David Crestwich, joined as always by the great college football guru, Garrett Bastardi. Uh, big show today, a lot to get to. Uh, Garrett and I are going to recap Penn State's win over the West Virginia Mountaineers last weekend. Penn State opens up at 1 0 on the season um, after the 38 to 15 win as they welcome in the Fighting Blue Hens this week. So we're going to preview that game, give our thoughts on the win, what went wrong, uh, areas to improve. Uh, that being said, uh, as always, today's episode is brought to you by Protocol Beverage, born from just a few dudes in Erie, Pennsylvania, looking to create the perfect drink for active people who work hard and play hard. Uh, enjoy responsibly. Um, must be 21 to enjoy. With that being said, Garrett, welcome to the show. Penn State 1-0. Uh, you were at the game. What was the feel like to have football back in Happy Valley? It was great. Uh, you know, great environment. Uh, always love night games in, in Beaver Stadium. It was a, uh, you know, a lot of energy in the stadium. I would say it wasn't as, not to knock, it, it didn't have that same night vibe that you have against Ohio State or Michigan. Um, but it had a, a lot of excitement, um, a lot of expectation that we were going to, I think it, you know, setting the tone at a 20 point favorite, um, and setting that line early, uh, kind of came in with an expectation that, okay, we should run over this team. Um, and you know, I, I, I think that a lot of people were surprised that it was 14, seven and a half. Um, and so it kind of made people maybe a little bit of a nervous energy, but man, it was great to have football back in happy Valley. Um, you know, 38, 15 is a, uh a pretty workmanlike performance against a team that I think is going to end up, uh, you know, playing a bowl game this year. And if not, you know, may, maybe being a, a dark horse in the big 12. Yeah. They thought, they thought as any 20 point underdog would face opening up the season against a worthy opponent like the Nittany lions. Uh, but 38 to 15, uh, late controversial, mm -hmm. late touchdown there at the end. Some may say controversial. I say that's a, that's you play to win the game. Um, and they were going yeah, against the ones of, of West Virginia. So it wasn't like, uh, it was anything absurd, but it yeah, was. Man, uh, I, I, I don't really get how you can drive down the field, go for two, make it a two possession game, kick an onside kick, and then get mad when the other team was like, I'm going to, I'm going to play back. I'm, you know, I'm going to put my twos in there and try to score. Uh, maybe that's why West Virginia has had four, you know, losing seasons in a row. Maybe it's a little bit of a mentality shift that they need. Um, I'm not going to that, – that type of stuff is dumb to me. You know, it, we, we've seen time and time of again – time and time again, um, you know, the old heads will remember this. You know, Penn State in 94 didn't win a national championship because Joe Paterno let the dogs off against teams like Illinois and, and Indiana and didn't win by four touchdowns, only won by two. So in today's football, like, if you, if you don't want them to score, then don't let them score. I, I think it's a stupid thing. I, I think it's a waste of time that – Coach Franklin even have, has to address it, and I think it's beneath Neil Brown to uh, to be complaining about something like that. You know, it, it's just that that I haven't said anything on Twitter about that. I haven't said anything about it. I've let everybody else kind of talk about it. But yeah, man, it, it, that was a stupid little thing. You lost. You just lost by three touchdowns. Get on the bus, go home, figure out a way to win next week. I think Neil Brown had West Virginia plus twenty four and a half. I think that's why he I was think, so upset. <laughs> I think that was it. Or, I'm sorry, plus twenty and a half. I think. I, yeah. I think the late touchdown I really forget about what I said. State. Yeah. Forget so um, you were there in person. Obviously, it was yeah. just uh, people away from being um, the most uh, attended Penn State game ever. It was top five. Uh, yeah. I had a different experience. Uh, NBC mm -hmm. rocked it for their first ever presentation yeah. of Big Ten football. That was really neat. Uh, the commentators mm -hmm. did an excellent job. Just the whole presentation, the halftime show, I mm -hmm. thought was pretty neat. Uh, and their delivery was great there. But um, yeah. As I said at the beginning of the show, we're going to go through uh, our takeaways from the game. As we know, it was it was a win, want to know that that's what Coach Franklin preaches. That's what the team preaches every week. There, uh, I guess the first question was that we kind of get to see this new quarterback in Drew, and uh, 
from a stat category, played a terrific game from the eye test, played a terrific game. Uh, how did your expectations of how you thought he would perform really align with uh, the, the game he put out Saturday? Yeah, uh, you know, a couple of things. That, that first pass, uh, I, I texted our, our dear friend, A.J. Youngmark, former Penn State football manager. I'm like, are you kidding me with that throw, right? I mean, just, you know, shifting around the pocket. It's not like he had a clean pocket. Uh, just rifles of all, you know, 45, 50 yards without any effort. Uh, and I think that that was what everybody had been waiting for. Uh, I think it was a very solid performance from Drew. Um, I think it, you know, I felt comfortable with him, right? I, I, I didn't feel at any moment that I, you have to really hold your breath. There were a couple, there were a couple throws, really just one uh, throw that, that made me nervous. That was, that was the ball that was tipped um, and almost picked off in the second quarter. Um, the one that was almost intercepted in the end zone was just was just behind him. You know, it, it's a touchdown if he throws a pass. He's he's uh, you know capable of throwing. And so, um, you know, I, I'll stress that I think that you know we'll get into this a little bit. I think that the line play was something that was a little bit surprising to me. Drew was under a lot of pressure all night and had to shift and, and move around in the pocket. And for him to go twenty one for twenty nine for you know three bills a little over three bills and three touchdowns without, you know, just standing back there like a statue and dishing it, I think was impressive. And I think it could have been better. Uh, I think on, I believe it was third and two, maybe early in the third, uh, you know, we have a touchdown to, to Keandre Lambert Smith. Um, you know, we, we run a really, it's kind of an interesting package with three, three guys bunched to the left. Um, and just a quick slant. I'm a big quick slant guy, as Mikey knows in NCAA football. And uh, you know, KLS just drops the ball, and it, it's a uh, it's a touchdown. There's nobody there, um, and so we had a drop touchdown there. We had a drop touchdown uh, later in the third as well. Um, and so you know, those are type of things that are not in really in Drew's control. But yeah, man, I, I think it was a really workmanlike performance, and um, I, I think he can win us games. I think uh, uh, you know, thank you for your service, Cliff. Um, but, you know, I go back and watch last year's game, and that game is probably an 18 to 20 point game against Purdue, the last year's opening season game. Um, but Cliff throws a pick six, you know, late in the late in the third, early in the fourth to kind of put us behind the eight ball. You're not getting any of that from Drew, I, I don't think. You know, he might have some games here and there where it might be harder um, against some stiffer competition, but he, he has a capability of going out and winning us games rather than having to kind of rely on the rest of the team to win games. Sure, and we knew what Drew was capable of doing. Um, he came out there uh, and threw the 72-yard strike to Keandre Lambert-Smith, which that's when I kind of was like, we got a guy. We, we have a guy yeah. who's going to go out there and be a baller. Yep. Uh, he did scare me on that kind of the peel back uh, in the second quarter when he tried to throw across his body. I'd, I'd like to mm -hmm. see him either toss that right into the seventh row and try to hit someone mm -hmm. in the crowd or just either – uh, I'm not a big take a sack guy there. Just maybe try to extend the play. But outside of two throws, it was a it was a great game uh, from yeah. Mr. Alar. Uh, we we saw them take that early seven nothing lead. Uh, it was kind of good competition for Penn State the whole way through. I thought mm -hmm. what West Virginia was able to do defensively was enough to stick around. Uh, like mm -hmm. you said, we'll touch on this in a little bit. Penn State's offensive line. Uh, really, really was beat a lot of plays where uh, they need Drew could use an extra second there in the pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first thing, uh, the biggest question going in was who's going to be this clear number one wide receiver? And I think we have our answer now that Keandre Lambert Smith is that man. Uh, two mm -hmm. touchdowns, just an absurd stat line um, from him. Four catches, 123 yards. Two of them went for touchdowns. We really didn't mm -hmm. see much uh, out of our tight ends, which we'll touch on a little bit there in terms of the game plan. Yeah. Uh, X's nose, but the wide receiver group, Garrett, nine different Nittany lines catch passes. Uh, your major takeaways from from the receiving gang there? Yeah, the you know, first takeaway. Uh, the I, I was I was at the game uh, with my wife, and I mentioned several times, I'm like you know, not that she really cared very much, uh, but it was you know, where are the tight ends? I mean, with nothing up the seams. Um, you you know, no no kind of drag in the read. And then throwing a ball up the seam to to Warren. I don't even think Theo Johnson caught a ball, um, or maybe even had one thrown to him. Interesting. I wonder if that was intentional. Um, I don't know why it would be, but it it seemed. I don't know how you can go away from those guys um, as much as you know, especially when the wide receiver room is probably your biggest question mark. 
I would say that Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson were probably our, our, you know, your most solid guys coming into the season as receiver. Um, but yeah, I think there were a few drops out there that uh, you, you, we have to get cleaned up. You know, one by Keandre Lambert Smith that I mentioned earlier. Um, that, you know, there were two potential touchdowns, and so yeah, West Virginia played a lot of bend don't break. The the game probably should have been either you know twenty to seven or twenty four seven at the half, and it's it's fourteen seven because of two missed field goals and uh, and a drop touchdown. Um, but you know, I, I think the all in all, um, you know, spreading the ball around to nine different guys. Uh, 332 yards uh, total receiving for the uh, for the receiving core, but yeah, I, I think you know the the one kind of bigger takeaway. I thought uh, Little Cliff Liam Clifford was someone who was more of a focal point than I thought he was going to be, um, and then Dante Cephas was less of a focal point than maybe I think a lot of people thought he was going to be. Um, I think we mentioned last week that he we kind of knew that he might have been a little bit. Um, I don't want to say oversold, but he wasn't going to come out and have a big game early. He, he was kind of running with the threes. And so, um, you know, Liam Clifford seems pretty reliable. Uh, Malik McLean, big dude. He's a, that is a, that's a guy. If, he, if his hands are working, we can throw some balls up to him. And so um, I think there are positives. There are also some, some negatives that need to be cleaned up, but it's week one. So. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with you um, there with, the uh, the wide receiver room of guys stepping up who not necessarily we didn't expect them to do as well but I thought Garrett I thought Harrison Wallace looked comfortable in that offense mm-hmm. and it's nice having DeAndre Lambert Smith uh, to kind of eat up the scene Dante Sivas really in that slot route and um, Malik McLean we know what he can do he's going to make some plays in the red zone this year mm-hmm. uh, he's going to be a target but I think from scheme wise I, I think there's nothing to be alert about because. They didn't force the ball to the tight ends. And that may have been West Virginia's game plan where they said, listen, you're going to beat us over the top. You guys haven't Mm -hmm. proven to us that you can throw to these new wideouts. We're going to shut down your tight ends, line up our linebackers outside, force you to make throws to these guys. And we saw guys like Liam Clifford, who he caught that middle screen. That was, I mean, granted, it was a good, it it was a uh, excellently, yeah, excellently, perfectly designed (laughs) play there. Let's watch out for the big words. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I forgot my dictionary today, so it's kind of yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. rough. But uh, Liam yeah. Clifford obviously had had a couple catches. But let let's go over to because I think we should just brush on this. I don't think it's an area of concern. Uh, the special teams uh, that Penn State punted twice, but obviously Sanders mm-hmm. couple uh, he looked shaky. You could tell he's a little nervous. He was a little mm-hmm. giddy. Uh, the first kick, you can kind of tell he hesitated going in. And I'm not a kicking expert yeah. by any means, but it wasn't fluent. It didn't look natural. Any area to worry about field goals in your in your mind? Yeah, I, I'm a little I'm a little bit worried. Uh, you know, we've had we've had some luck in having some guys who've been pretty reliable. Um, not necessarily big legs. I wouldn't say Tyler Davis had a big leg, but in what seventeen or eighteen or whatever it was, he was you know fifteen for fifteen on field goals. I mean, they'll take that. Um, I. I like I said, a, l- a little bit concerned. You know, I, I think we need to see week two. Um, you know, I think if you have two kickers, do you have any kickers? You know, you talk about that in, in with the uh, with the quarterback play. I, a team I think about that's been kind of doing revolving doors on kickers forever has been Alabama. Well, anytime you have a short kicker and a long kicker, guys who are kind of 50-50, you have a tendency to be a little, um, you know, a little bit nervous. And but Penn State has been known, you know, under Coach Franklin, if there has been consistency, it's been in the special teams. I mean, Penn State t- takes pride in playing complementary football. Uh, I would have to think that that gets figured out. Um, you know, it, Coach Franklin made a big deal about Sander going in there into the locker room and apologizing. I, you know, that's that's great. You know, got to make the, go and make the kicks, right? Um, and I'm not going to sit here and say it's an easy thing to do. But yeah, there's a little bit of, of concern there. Um, but it's again, we have another week to to get into. You know, I, I would say if we can, if if there's a couple instances where it's fourth and short from the 25 to 35, um, you know, maybe situationally next week, test these guys and put them out there and try to make have them kick a couple field goals through, um, rather than going for it just so we can get the a couple more reps under their belt. Yeah, and. Um... Alex Falcons will be the kicker this week. Franklin said he will uh, be. Okay, pressed her, and he mentioned also that the the kicking race was tight between Sanders and Falcons mm-hmm. going in 
to it. And mm-hmm. he said it's equally as tight now. Uh, Falcons, not a lot of room to breathe. But I'm a big – I'm not an anti-kicker, but I think you should really only <laughs> kick field goals unless it's fourth and 18 on the plus side of the field. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. extra point. College football's kind of gone I to hate, that a little bit. Yeah, I hate 30-yard field goals on fourth and four. Uh, I'm a big go for it. I mean, it, you see that a lot at the NFL level with this new era um, of mm-hmm. – of offensive aggressiveness, but um, like you said, without those two missed field goals, uh, it, it's it's a different game. And Penn State goes in the second half, yeah. twenty-four to eight, pulls away, gets the victory there. Uh, but mm-hmm. just to not really put down West Virginia. West Virginia is not a great football team, but I thought schematically what they did was they did enough to kind of make it interesting. I mean, it was a one possession game yeah. late in the third quarter, and props to yeah. props to their offensive um, really outlook going into it they, they incorporated mm-hmm. a couple things Garrett that I noticed um, from I watched mm-hmm. a lot of NFL obviously and they, they did two things that really stuck out to me they ran the sugar huddle in the red zone that you see Kansas mm-hmm. City use a lot in Mahomes and Andy Reid yeah. loves that and they they also kind of grabbed a play out of Nick Sirianni's playbook with a QB sneak mm-hmm. uh, which I'd like to see Penn State because Penn State runs that that powerhouse towards the red zone with three backs I'd love yeah. to see them, yeah. them kind of do the push so that was just two takeaways there that that I really mm-hmm. had but yep. uh, Penn State comes away with the win. They're one and zero. That's mm-hmm. the goal every week. Coach Franklin preaches it, as we know. Uh, but let's just actually let's touch on the defense first, because I thought obviously yeah. uh, Abdul Carter did his thing. There was a bunch of guys um, who really stepped up there uh, mm-hmm. and made made plays when it counts. Uh, Johnny Dixon, who we we knew going in was going to shine, he had two pass breakups. Uh, really did well in man coverage. Uh, I thought Wheatley did a great job. Uh, Cam Miller and obviously Isaac; those mm-hmm. guys really stuck out to me. Uh, they, yeah. they gave up about 150 yards rushing, which I I don't love personally, yeah. which is kind of concerning, knowing what Michigan did <clears throat> to us last year and knowing who they yep. have and what they're capable of doing. Uh, but your mm-hmm. your uh, major takeaways from the defense? Yeah, um, I, I think that there's a little bit of a you know my biggest takeaway. On, on both sides of the ball was, you know, the line of scrimmage and up front was uh, a little bit concerning to me. Um, just because, you know, Neil Brown did say, or, you know, if we go if we go back to the offensive side of the ball real quick, we're going to try to make the quarterback beat us, and he did. Uh, so we're not a one-trick pony, which is great uh, on nights that, you know, maybe we weren't, maybe we're not as physical up front as we, we should be, and I'm less concerned about the offensive side of the ball. The defensive side of the ball, um, you know, I think that, you know, we weren't playing Michigan week one, right? We we're playing West Virginia week one. But that performance in the front seven against the run was very similar to what the f- performance of the front seven was against Michigan. A lot of two guys in one gap, right, with one gap open, a lot of confusion, a lot of, uh, you know, whether it's missed assignments. Um, and I, I'm just, yeah, I had the same, I had the same concern last year. I love the aggressiveness of Manny Diaz. Manny Diaz at every stop he has been at has had these games out of nowhere where teams just ran wild. You know, Michigan last year, when he was at Texas, there was a BYU game that actually had him forced out. They gave up, you know, over 400 yards rushing. Same deal when he was at Mississippi State. Um, That's my concern is that it might be a little bit more schematic than maybe we all think it might be. Um, where if we're not in the, if we're so aggressive all over the place that if there are, if there is not, um, you know, great gap discipline, the holes are there. And so that's just something to watch. I think we're going to learn about a lot about this deep. Obviously there's a ton of hype about the defense. The secondary is very good. Um, they did get beat on a couple different times, a couple different times. If you're watching, I don't know if you could see it on TV, you can see it in person and just, we got away with, you know, with throws that just weren't very good, but there was, there were a couple times the secondary was beat. Um, and one of the times it, 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 it bit, uh, it bit the guys on the, on the far side, um, or on the, on the near side of the Penn state sideline, there was just a blown coverage, but we're going to find out a lot week three against Illinois. That team pounds the football. Um, and we're going to see, you know, where, where this front seven really is when it comes to uh, when it comes to that. So I, I spent a little bit more time on that because that was my big takeaway is I don't want to overreact. It's week one. We beat a power five school by three touchdowns, a team that came out hot was, this is all they've been thinking about all summer is beating Penn state, preparing for Penn state. Um, 
so I don't want to overreact, but I still have hesitancy about, yeah, we gave up over five, what, what was it, close to five yards per rush, you know, maybe four yards per rush. Um, if you get rid of sacks, 146 yards, um, maybe we're nitpicking, maybe we're not, but that's just something we're going to have to, we're going to have to keep an eye on. We're going to have to monitor that, Mike. Yeah. And I, I think like what you just said is, man, like we won by, we won by 20 points. Like we're, we're not nitpicking here. We're just saying like what could potentially harm Penn State down the way. We're not taking away from yeah. the defensive side. Uh, and to your point, I thought Manny Diaz overall called a pretty good game. I love his third mm-hmm. down aggressiveness. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the color commentator explained it perfectly. Uh, he talked about the way he teaches his linebackers to pursue, but but not overplay. And th- they mm-hmm. speed to a point where they're able to, when you encounter these really athletic quarterbacks, they're able to kind of retract, mm-hmm. contain, and then make the play. And Penn State makes up for that because they have dudes everywhere who can make those tackles. Uh, but yeah. I mean, and like, Garrett Green like, and Garrett Green was an athletic quarterback. He he yeah, should get a lot of credit. He, I mean, he, Neil very Brown capable said he's guy. the fastest guy on their team. You know, yeah. And he had a he had a, he scored on that. I mean, it was a it was a three yard keeper on the the read. But I mean, the the kid looked good. It was no, yeah. It, it no was no Joe Schmo. I think out they're going to be good. I think he's going to have a good year. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Um, but that was really our breakdown um, of the game itself. And this week, uh, the the fighting Delaware Blue Hen come to town. Yeah, Don't uh, they're on. an FCS team. The last time Penn State played an FCS team was 2019, I believe it was Nova, or 2021. 2021, mm-hmm. they played. Uh, they beat Nova. It was 38-17 there. Uh, they, uh, just a quick fly over here because we're just going to come out and say, and this may bite me in the ass, uh, Penn State's going to win this game and shouldn't be a reason to worry. Vegas hasn't even set a line. Mm-hmm. You can't find a line as we're mm-hmm. recording here right. Wednesday night. You can't find a line on this game. Uh, which is, is something to be said. I mean, it, it happens often when you encounter these FCS, FBS, where the, the even the, the odds makers don't know where to put the line. They don't want to set it at 55 and a half points and Penn State pulls their starters in the second quarter. So so that mm-hmm. the line's really not there. And, and we use the line it, uh, from, for obvious reasons, but it's indicative of how teams stack up to one another. But it's a team last year, Garrett. Uh, they finished 23rd in FCS. They actually beat uh, St. Francis, uh, PA out of Loretta there uh, in the, the first Whoa. round, 56 to 17 in their playoffs. Um, Ryan Cardi, who was on their 2003 national championship team, he's their head coach. He's their play caller. Uh, you're going to see okay. kind of just listening to Coach Franklin. Um, and I watched a little bit uh, of their game last week, but it's it's a lot of 11 personnel, a lot of RPO. You're going to see a lot mm-hmm. of quick screens, and that's really what you have to do to beat this fast Penn State team. you got to slow down the rush by – by doing those things. Uh, their quarterback, Ryan O'Connor, uh, two interceptions, one touchdown. Uh, like I said, they're 1-0. and uh, A couple other guys to keep an mm-hmm. eye out for. Uh, Chase McGovern, McGovern, I'm sorry, he's their, their defensive end. He's a stud. And uh, they also got a pretty good special teams player, former Big Ten returner of the year and Joshua Youngblood, who was a Kansas guy. He was originally at Rutgers yeah. first. Uh, so he's, yeah. He's something yeah. that it, you guys want to really look out for uh, in the return game. And we only punted mm-hmm. twice last time. But obviously, if we're lighting up the scoreboard, the more chances he's going to have here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just just uh, going into this game, um, Franklin, he wants to uh, be better on third down. Penn State was three for nine last week on third down. He wants to create more turnovers and obviously tighten it up on special teams. Uh, what are you looking mm-hmm. forward to most in this game from seeing from the Nitty Lions? Yeah. Nothing. Uh, I, look, I don't. I don't think Delaware is going to sit here and run for a hundred yards. I would. I would like to see more of a control, controlling of the line of scrimmage from the defensive side of the ball. Um, you know, get up early, get up big, and get Bo some reps. Bo Privula some reps in the second half. Um, he he has some. Uh, he has some special talent. Um, you know, a lot of people have have said he's he's just like a spitting image of Trace. And so, um, you know, get some of these guys some reps, get them out there. Um, I, I just don't, I don't think that there's a whole lot to say about this game. Um, you know, clean it like we, you, you just said it. I mean, Coach Franklin said it best. You know, clean up the special teams. Uh, you know, be better on third down. You know, clean up the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, something that was interesting week one that I, I, I want to see. You know, going forward is 
the, the amount of different formations Penn State ran, uh, you know, on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, two or three ones that we have not seen um, ever under James Franklin and none in the, under the Ursic era uh, so far. Uh, power T from first and 10 at the 40 yard line for seven yards. Uh, I want to see how the playbook continue. And they're not going to reveal a whole lot more against Delaware. Um, but I just want to see how the flow of the game is called offensively uh, in the first half. And, you know, whether, you know, there's so many weapons in that backfield from, from, um, from Drew's arm to the, to the tailbacks. Um, let, let's just see how that plays out, but get up early, be clean. would like to see us go two for two, three for three from field goal range. Um, and then, uh, and then get the, the twos running, running some good reps in the second half and then prepare for a, a you know, a, a tough game. You know, fortunately, yeah, I don't think Delaware is going to be a look, look ahead game, but I think the Illinois game is going to be a tough game. So, you know, be prepared for that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a game where you, you fix what needs to be fixed. You get your guys yeah. out, um, you stay healthy. I think that's a big thing here. Uh, get a comfortable lead. I don't think Drew should play in the second half of this game at all, even though he needs no. experience. There's no reason if they're up 35 nothing at halftime mm -hmm. that he or Nick Singleton should step on the field. Uh, let, I think it's a big Dante Cephas game. I think Liam Clifford scores a mm -hmm. touchdown in the second half. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if we saw a lot of folk real action late. Um, and like you said, just just tune up. And I don't want to say look ahead to Illinois here because it's so, it's so tough to – really focus on a, a a subpar team like Delaware, but it's it's what you got to do. So yeah, the Blue yeah. Hens are coming to town. Um, not as tradition on this show that we've done the last three mm -hmm. years is uh, Garrett's favorite segment. It's really the only reason he does this show. He doesn't really like yeah, football that a... much. <laughs> we no. just like naming no, these. I just, like, uh, we're gonna I just like, I like famous alumni. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> we're going to draft our famous <laughs> alumni uh, from Delaware. And if you're at a tailgate yeah. this week, you can kind of bring this up. Uh, as mm -hmm. you know, uh, Garrett, I'll give you the first pick here of who. Man, two weeks in a row, I'm getting first pick. All right. Is it snake draft? Yeah, snake. All right. Um, I'm doing famous two-star athlete at the University of Delaware, my uncle Matt Bastardi as my number one pick. Baseball that's player, football pick. player. Yeah, that's uh, it's a no-brainer for me. Um. Been debating this uh, with my number one pick. Hmm. Let's see here. Man, Mike, you yeah, did not study before the test. No, I did. I did. I did. Uh, I'm going to go with Classic Chad. Classic Mike. Uh, he pitches for the Nationals. He played for the Pirates. Um, I'm a baseball guy. So I'm going to go there. Okay. And my number two pick is Brian Gorman, MLB umpire. Uh, so we're sticking with a, uh, sticking okay. with a trend. Okay. Um, and I get two picks here and then we're, mm -hmm. and then we're, you get one. All right, man. I am surprised. I'm surprised. I'm going to go Pat Devlin, former Penn Stater transferred to Delaware. And then Joe Flacco. There's a there's a couple there that I thought thought were going to be off the board early, but uh, okay, I I remember our number one pick now. Chris Christie's my number one pick. <laughs> I was thinking of going for. I'll tell you what, he could play left tackle for us. He'd be a hell of a left tackle. He would be. He would be very good. I I think he'd take up a lot of space. Maybe nose guard. Uh, honorary but, pick. Uh, shout out to James Smith, one of our founding fathers of this great country here. Is that one? Is that the guy who signed the declaration? He signed the declaration, yeah, as for for Pencil on Pennsylvania's behalf. So uh, James Smith, shout okay. out to James Smith. Uh, okay. But yeah, um, there was our draft. Uh, there's no line out there, but we will give a prediction um, and yeah. give our first touchdown score of the game. I didn't get it right mm -hmm. last week. I said Theo Johnson, who didn't even record a catch. Mm hmm. I had a big I, I said there would be a big pass in the first drive and then I think I said Katron Allen would punch it in, which we didn't get to that point because the big pass was the touchdown. So um I, I think you know, another thing I would like to see is is Nick Singleton Nick Singleton break one this week. And so I think he does it early. And so I'm gonna say that Singleton has a touchdown run of over forty yards in the first drive. I'm gonna go Penn State. 
52 to 10, 52 to 7. I would like to see them not give up a touchdown or anything more than 10 points. I'm going to go Penn State 52 10. Okay. Uh, score wise, I'm going to say 42 3 Penn State. And this mm. is a wild prediction for my first oh, touchdown. Uh, I think it's going to be a Penn State defensive touchdown. I like it. I like that. I think I it's that. either going to be a scoop and score or an interception. Mm. Uh, right. I think Delaware gets the ball. So the, first. Only, the, only, the only two ways that you could score a defensive touchdown. Okay. Covering my bases. Uh yeah, I think I think it's a I think it's an easy Penn State victory. Get right where you have to. Um, see some separation in the second half, get some guys some experience, stay yeah. healthy, as I keep keep noting there. Uh, but that's that's pretty much it uh for the show today. Another another yeah, packed man. weekend of college football here. Um yeah. but as always, Garrett, appreciate Ain't you coming man. on, man. They go to the big, U. Big weekend that's down big here. Game. And Texas at Alabama. Man, let's go. Get that get that game on Peacock early for Penn State. Get up early, get up big, and then big loaded college football Saturday. What we live for. Exactly. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. Here is the Nittany Lions get ready to play. Uh, the fighting blue hens of Delaware. Uh, appreciate you guys' uh, support. We got a lot of support last week, whether it was text um, calls or just people coming up to to me um really appreciate it but uh we'll be back next week to recap this game and, and preview illinois as penn State has to hit the road uh farewell garrett any any parting words here no man want to know this week thanks for having me on mike take care everyone <laughs>